Great to see you guys today. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hope you had a good week this week. Want to welcome each of our locations as well. And you know, we've got a new uh, creature in our house uh, for the last uh, many months, a little puppy named Stella. My wife Lori took a picture of her recently in a t-shirt that she bought her that I think uh, kind of says it pretty well. I don't know if you can read that, but it says, huge ears, worst listener. How many of you have a dog that has, that's the worst listener? You know what I'm saying? She knows exactly what's going on, but she has her own mind about things, and uh, she's doing it her way. This little puppy, um, she's eight months old this week, and she, she did something no other dog's uh, ever done that, that I've had, which is she gets in these moments where she just literally follows me around everywhere I go. Like, it doesn't matter, even trying to go to the bathroom, like, she's right on my heels. You have to, like, run to go to the bathroom and slam the door just to get a minute. And then she's, like, sniffing at the door, face right down at the, it's kind of annoying at, at one point. And it starts to feel a little stalkerish, like she's always watching. If I move, she'd be dead asleep. If I move and make any noise, her eye opens. She's always aware. And I thought, man, this dog loves me. Like, wow, loves me. But I've realized it has nothing to do with that. She is following me around because once I dropped a piece of popcorn. And after that, she's realized I'm the weak link in the chain. And she follows me everywhere I go in hopes that something will fall to the ground. Because I've noticed when she follows me, she's not looking at me. Any of you got a pet like this? She's looking at the floor all around me, right? It has nothing to do with me. She's just waiting. And why she thinks something could happen in the bathroom that she's all about, I don't know. But anyway... She's all about it. And so I finally, a couple days ago, I got sick of her following me around. And I said, all right, look, you want a treat? You know, and I took her over and, and uh, we have these little treats that we give her, but we also have these big treats. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to give her the big treats. You know, so I get the big treat out. It's too big for her to chew in one. So I break it in half and I give her half of it. I kind of do it in such a way that she doesn't know there's another half, right? I give her that half. She eats it all up. It takes her like 30 seconds to chew it all up. It's a big treat, right? And when she's done... She just looks at me. It's this very stoic look that says very clearly, more. And so I give her the other half of the treat, and she eats all of that, and she chews it up. No change, no reaction. More. And finally, I said to her this. I said, you just always want more, don't you? It doesn't matter how much you get, you just want more. And I said, I understand that. I'm a lot like that. And then I sort of stood up and thought, you know, you can learn a lot from a dog. Because that's a human uh, thing, isn't it? We always tend to want more. I can't just eat one chip. I want more, right? I I, I can't just watch one show if it's really good. I want to binge the whole season, you know? I, I, I can't just have one record. I love records. I can't just have one record. As soon as I get it, I'm like, oh, that's cool. But I want more. And we tend to want more and more and more. I mean, you get a three-day weekend. It's awesome. But as soon as you go back to work, you wish it was four, right? You know, you, you, uh, maybe you have three kids under the age of six. And so you're broke, exhausted, and worn out. And you probably don't want more. But I promise you, the grandparents want more, <laughs> right? They want more. Bring it on. Whatever we have, we tend to want more. I went into Best Buy It's been a long time since I really like walked around Best Buy. And I went into Best Buy uh, this summer and walked through and just looked at the new TVs. Have you guys seen the new TVs? Wow. The resolution on those things. And, you know, I'm walking around seeing all these TVs and the price is coming down for good technology. There's so much. And why is it every appliance I buy breaks, but the TV never dies? Has anybody noticed this? I'm like, I walk, if you have a 10 or 15 year old TV, you'll feel me. I walk past the thing. I just want to like kick it, you know, like anything to get it to short out so that Lori will let us upgrade to the new TV. It just doesn't matter what you have. There's always more. The Rolling Stones sang years ago, I can't get no. And it's real. It's a human characteristic. And I actually think it's not bad in and of itself. I tend to think that God wired us in such a way that we always will want 
more from the things of this world. He wired us in such a way that, that if we will allow him, we'll finally begin to realize that the real desire for more is a desire for more of him because he's the only one that can fill the desire in our hearts and in our lives. It was the church father, Augustine, who said this, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. You've made us for, our, for yourself, and our heart will be restless until it rests in you. So we started this teaching series last week called Follow Him, and we're looking at five different encounters Jesus has with people that he challenges to follow me. Jesus often introduces these two words, follow me, again and again in key moments with key people to challenge them to take the next step in their spiritual life. And last time we looked at, at Matthew, who was a tax collector, sort of on the outside from a lot of perspectives, but Jesus came to him anyway and said, follow me, and he went on that journey. Today I want to look with you at the story of somebody who's known as the rich young ruler. So I just want you to imagine your favorite young, beautiful icon. Maybe they're an athlete, maybe they're an entrepreneur, maybe they're uh, in, in entertainment, but you look at these people and you're like, oh man, they've got it together. They have money, they look amazing, they got, you know, they've got influence and power, they've got it all. That's who this dude was, and yet he still comes up to Jesus, and here's what we read in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. When we get to the red word, say it real loud here with me, but it says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit what? Eternal life. Now this guy was rich, successful, he had influence, he kind of had all that the world had to offer, but he still wanted more. He knew that that wasn't enough. He comes to Jesus, he, he drops down in front of him, and he says, how do I inherit eternal life? That word eternal in the original language, it doesn't just refer to like length of time, like in eternity. You know, we hear the word eternity that goes on forever. It also refers to the quality of time. In other words, life that goes on eternally, yes, but life that is meaningful even now. That's the whole idea behind eternal life. It's a life that begins now and continues on into the next life. This guy's saying, listen, how do I get to the next level of life? Not only in this life, but in the life to come. I've got, he's got money, possessions, all the things, and it's not enough. He says, how do I get more? And Jesus is going to challenge him in the way he answers him. And, and I think he's going to remind us that you cannot give up more than God will give back. In the spiritual journey, sometimes God is going to ask you to give up some things that maybe you're putting ahead of him in your life and to surrender some things that maybe you make number one in your life. But the real meaning here is by releasing those things that maybe took the number one spot in your life and putting God in the number one spot, that what you get back is so much more. More joy, more love, more purpose. So the first challenge we're going to see in finding more satisfaction in our faith is simply this, to trade up to God's best. Trade up to God's best. I tend to think there's a couple kinds of people in the world. There are people who like to fix things up, and then there are people who like to just sort of trade up. When it breaks, you just get a new one. My wife, and you often like marry each other. My wife is a fix-up person, 100%. Our whole house is filled with things she bought. She could tell you how much she paid for every single item, and it's always like pennies or dollars. It's always from thrift stores and garage sales and swap meets. I was at a swap meet recently. I'm like, what? Look at all this crap everywhere. <laughs> Just saying, like, like, this stuff is, who wants this? My wife wants it, all of it. Because she can take it and fix it. She spray paints stuff in the backyard. She's so proud of it. I'm like, I will buy you a new thing. <laughs> no, no. She wants to fix it up. She's a fix-up person. I'm a trade-up person. I'm not that handy. You know, I'm just like, it broke. You know, I'm trying to break my TV right now. I mean, <laughs> we got to get a new one. It's trade-up. And all this was great, except we have this one item that we bought years ago. Lori got a great deal on it. It's this really old record player. And I'm telling you, she loves this thing so much. This thing was going to be in my life until I die. I'll show you a picture of it. This is just a photo I took uh, yesterday of it. I mean, look at that. 
vintage, amazing. I'm not sure you should clap for that. Oh, I'm going to hear about it now. She loves this thing, right? She loves it. And it actually worked when we first got it home. Years ago, we got it home and it, it sort of played, but like the cones and the speakers were all cracking and everything was sort of busted up. And so I got into vinyl records several years ago and, and I was like, man, I started thinking about how do I get rid of that thing so that I can get an actual record player? You know, let's trade up to something that sounds not like cardboard. And I tried that and you can, you can see where, how far that went. So we had to come up with this sort of uh, compromise of both fixing up and trading up. In other words, I basically had to gut the record player and put a new modern record player inside it and new speakers in it over time. I even had it torn up uh, yesterday uh, trying new cables because you never know, I might get a little more out of these better cables. This is, the, this is why audiophiles go broke and lose their mind, right? I think it's better. Do you think it's better? I don't know. Anyway, this is, I'm going to live with this the rest of my life, so this will never end, the upgrading on the old turntable system. And when it comes to life, I think some people just, you know, the rich young ruler was a guy, he didn't really want to trade up to a new life. He wanted to fix up his existing life to get to that next level of life. Check this out. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 18. Jesus responds to his question, how, how do I inherit eternal life? And he says, why do you call me what? Good. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. Now, this is kind of an interesting response, and commentators have wrestled with this for thousands of years, like, what is Jesus getting at here, you know, because how, why does he answer, why does he respond in this way? And commentators will point out that, the relig that this rich young ruler asked the question, when he came up to him, he said, good teacher, and the word good is, is a it's very specific word that's usually used in reference to God, and so he calls him good teacher, and it's almost like there's some flattery going on, some schmoozing that's happening here. And Jesus isn't going to have anything to do with it. He says, why do you call me good in that way? It's not just like, are you a good dude? It's more than that. Why do you call me good? And some people say, well, Jesus is sort of downplaying his divinity here. You know, if he is God in the flesh, like, what's he doing? Like, why do you call me good? Only God is good. But I think he's asking the question back to the rich young ruler and through him in scripture back to us, like, who do you say that I am? Why, why do you call me good? Because if Jesus is just a guy, then we can debate what he says and kind of take it or leave it. But if he is God in the flesh, then we do well to sort of take what he says and apply it to our life. So all of this is kind of working in the layers as Jesus responds to this rich young ruler. And then Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. He says, but to, Jesus says, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. And teacher, the man replied, I've what? Obeyed. You see that? I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Now, I've been around a long time. When I read something like this, I'm like, sure you have. You know what I'm saying? Like somebody comes along like, oh yeah, I've been doing that my whole life. Uh-huh. You probably got some, you know, stuff you want to sell me too from some special place far away that can never be proven. Anyway, he's like, I've been obeying these commandments all my whole life. Now in the culture, they often would obey the letter of the law, but not so much the spirit of the law. So you could hate somebody, you could even destroy their life, but as long as you don't murder them, You're all good. You're 100% religion approved, you know? You could break a vow, but what they would often do when they made promises, let's say you and I made a deal, a business deal, and we took vows, we're gonna make this promise to one another. This was before lawyers and paper and all that. And so they would make a vow, but if they kind of changed the, the way they worded one particular word in the vow, they would see it as a loophole and they could still basically cheat you, but stay 100% good to the vow that they made. So they would say, hey, I'm good. Anyway, all I'm saying is the guy probably didn't actually live a perfect life. Hello. But he, was, he saw himself as 100% religion approved. Jesus, I, this is, you know, he's like, how do I inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. He says, I've done all those. And so Jesus is going to challenge him to realize you don't just 
fix yourself when it comes to salvation. It's not that you get a little better and you work a little harder and you earn God's love. It's that salvation is a gift from God through Jesus Christ that you receive through faith. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. You're not good enough for it. You simply receive it. You trade up to a new life. You don't just fix up to a new life. And he's going to challenge you. Listen, whatever you're chasing to make yourself feel right, no matter how good it is, it's never going to be enough when it comes to our faith. It's never going to be enough for salvation. You're never going to be successful enough. You're never going to be popular enough. You'll never be wealthy enough. You'll never be moral enough. You'll never be responsible enough. You're never going to be talented enough. You're never going to be smart enough or committed enough because no matter how much you accomplish, earn, or achieve, it's still going to leave you needing something that only Jesus can give. So it's not a fix-up thing. It's a trade-up thing. And often following Jesus means letting go of something good to take hold of God's best. So here's Jesus' challenge, Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 21, to the rich young ruler. Looking at him, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, and here it is, what? follow me. He says, first, go sell everything you have. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. (laughs) He's like, I don't want eternal life that much. (laughs) Now, when you read that, like what's going on here? You know, is Jesus, like what's he doing in this moment? Well, I think first of all, There's something to the beginning of this passage that says Jesus felt genuine love for him. So Jesus saw into this guy's heart and he loved him. It wasn't a trick statement. It wasn't, you know, like a bait and switch kind of moment. He genuinely loved this guy. And I think this is a statement that we can all learn from, but I tend to read it as something specific to this rich young ruler because Jesus doesn't say this, this extremely to very many people when you read through the Bible, really to anybody. He says it to this rich young ruler. He's challenging him to look at what I think he put in his heart above God. And that was his possessions and his things and his money, his success. And Jesus says, for you, you gotta put God on the throne, not things, not your possessions. Go sell everything, give it to the poor, then come and follow me. Now that doesn't mean that we all need to go out and sell everything, although generosity is very important. And many of us, if we're honest, wrestle with putting things and money above God in our lives. But the rich young ruler is challenged to put God first. I think this applies to a lot of levels in our lives. I think about my own life. When I was growing up as a teenager, the thing that I wanted to be more than anything else was a musician. I I was in bands in high school. I loved music. I had my guitar, my rig, my little four-track recorder. I had all the things, you know, a bass guitar, electric guitar, amps, 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 amps. I was that guy, you know, and none of my bands were any good that I played in, but I was trying, living the dream. And uh, I mean, I remember at one point, my parents were so frustrated at me because I sat in the same place in my bedroom for years practicing my instrument so long that my bed started to collapse and they would have to like flip my mattress and rearrange it. It would collapse on the other side because I just, you know, I was into it, right? I was doing my thing. I was living my dream. So the day after I got out of high school, the day, like I graduated on a Friday and Saturday morning, I loaded up everything. I put this, had this little U-Haul trailer I rented that I attached to the back of my truck and I kissed my mama goodbye, and I drove away. As a stupid young person, I had no idea that I was just crushing her heart. Anyway, I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico to play in a band with some people that I had met. And I was following the Lord, but I was excited about music, and we played around, we gigged around, we did our thing, it was fun, and this went on for, I don't know, six, seven, eight months, And, and somewhere in the midst of all of this, I had this sense that God was impressing on my heart that that was not his path for my life. You ever been there? I mean, it was confirmed through everybody. If I, I didn't want to ask spiritual mentors anymore. The guy that led my small group at church, I don't know, they all said the same thing and it really made me angry. Every, you ever been in a place in your life, if you haven't, you will be, where everywhere you turn, you feel like God's like communicating to you and you're just like, stop, I got it. 
I just don't want to do it. You know, but like people are saying the same thing. Circumstances are saying the same thing. And my whole thing was, I've got to give this up. God has something else for me. And I didn't fully know what it was, but, but the more it went along, I finally got to a place where I'm like, all right, okay, I'll do it. You know, and so I said goodbye to, and by the way, when you're making a decision like that, you want to lean into the Bible. You want to lean into good, wise, spiritual counsel. You want to talk to other people that have wisdom and years and get their insight. Even if you don't like what they say, you don't just make that decision because you feel like it. I wouldn't, you know, it's like, oh man, because maybe you just need Pepto-Bismol and you'll feel different (laughs) tomorrow. But when it's confirmed again and again with wise counsel, my community group, this is why relationships are so important in the church. Why it's, why, when it's affirmed by people who around you, then I think you have something you have to seriously consider. And so I finally said goodbye to my friends in Albuquerque, and I actually was so heartbroken. I gave them all my gear. I left my amps, all this stuff I collected, all from from, uh, my teenage years. I left my amps, my instruments, my guitar. I left everything. I gave it my recording equipment, all of it, chords, all the things. And I just took an acoustic guitar, threw it in the back of the truck, and was driving home and I cried the whole way. I felt like my life was over. I'm like, all right, God, I'll serve you. It's gonna be terrible. (laughs) This is gonna be the most awful thing. Honestly, like, I was not in a good place. I remember I got pulled over by a highway patrol officer between Albuquerque and Amarillo. Of course I did. And he walked up to the window and he could tell I'd been bawling my eyes out. He's like, are you okay? And I remember telling him like, well, my life's over. You know, I'm going back to my crummy town and I just feel like this is what I'm supposed to do and all my dreams are dead. But other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be all right. And the guy gave me a warning, so there you go. Um, but that was how I felt in that moment. And I look back now all these years later and I realize in that moment, it felt like I was giving up what was most important to me in my life. And the truth was, I had made music an idol. And God was challenging me to put him first again in my life. Now, if you're a musician, good on you. This is not about that. Um, This is about what you put ahead of God in your life. God was saying, look, if you're willing to walk away from that, you'll find that I have actually wired you to do something else. He wired me to be a pastor. I've been doing it 30 years, and I love it. I absolutely love it. But I look back, and I couldn't see it then. All I could see was what I had to let go. Look, sometimes, and this isn't about your career choice. I believe God calls people to be great musicians and make beautiful music. I believe he calls people to be great teachers and to be great health instructors and fitness instructors. He calls people to you know, be police officers and lawyers and attorneys and doctors and do it all for the glory of him and moms and stay-at-home moms. You go down the list and stay-at-home dads, whatever. Like God has different seasons and different calls on all of us in our life. But the key is whatever he's calling you to, to keep him first. And in my life, I look back and realize so much of the good that has come into my life started when I really not only surrendered to Christ, but then later when I was willing to surrender what I put ahead of God in my life and trust him first. And here's what I've learned. You cannot give up more than God will give back. You can't give up more then God will give back. I mean, somebody here is dating somebody. Mm. And you know this isn't the somebody. Come on. Everybody around you knows this isn't the somebody. Every mentor in your life knows this isn't the somebody. Your daddy knows. Your mama knows. Everybody knows, but you don't want to let go. But listen, You can't give up more than God can give back. And if he's calling you to walk away from that relationship, even though it's scary, even though it's hard, have courage and walk away. Because only by walking away do you get to the best that God has for you down the road. Be willing to surrender. Some of you right now, you're trying to get out of debt 
You're dealing with some hard financial realities in your life and, and things are tight right now, but you've got a dream and a vision to get out of debt and be debt free. And I affirm that. I think it's a good biblical dream. It's not always a reality, but it's something we should all strive for. Your life will be better for it on the other side. And as Dave Ramsey says, sometimes you have to live like no one else so that later you can live like no one else. Sometimes you got to walk, sometimes you got to walk through Best Buy and go, get behind me, Satan. Uh-uh. That 15 year older is still working. I'm just going to be content with what I have because I have different dreams and goals. But sometimes following God, you have to let go. Now, this isn't about salvation. Salvation comes by trading up, surrendering our old life for the new life Christ gives us and receiving that by grace. But as we follow him, God will sometimes call us to give some things up but I believe he will always give us more than he calls us to get up, give up in the long run. All right, second thought is this, to enjoy your reward. So Jesus says to this guy, sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. And the guy goes away like, uh-uh, nope. And Jesus' disciples are watching all of this happen. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse um, 26. It says the disciples were astounded then who in the world can be saved, they ask. Because they're like, wow, this is extreme. Got to give everything up. Then who in the world can be saved? And Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is what? Possible with God. See, this is a divine spiritual thing, salvation. And Jesus is saying, you don't just earn your way up to it. You receive it as a gift. It's Humanly impossible, but with God, everything is possible. And so he's saying, in other words, it's not about your sacrifice. It's about my sacrifice. Yeah, you may be called to give up some things. You may be called to, to serve and to give and to love. But ultimately, God doesn't just want like your tithe, your gift financially. He doesn't just want your prayers. He doesn't just want your weekend attendance. I tell people it's way worse than that. He wants your whole life. He wants your whole life. But this is not about how you earn salvation. Salvation cannot be earned. It can only be offered in grace and accepted in faith. Only God makes your salvation possible through faith in Jesus Christ. And so you may feel like something's impossible in your life. You may feel like it's impossible to break free from your past or your mistakes, from the mess you've made of your relationships. But Jesus says, look, everything is possible with God. You may feel like it's impossible to give up your hurts and your habits and your hangups. And maybe you feel like they have too strong of a grip on your life. But Jesus says, everything's possible with God. You may say that, look, I can't give up the way I live or the way I make a living. There's no way out for me. Jesus is saying, everything is possible with God. You say, it's too hard for me to change, or it's too difficult. I'm too old. I'm too uh, experienced. I'm too burned out. I'm too unimportant. But Jesus is saying, everything is possible with God. Somebody says, I'm too filled with anxiety, or I'm too filled with fear. I've got too much bad going on in my life to step out in faith. But Jesus is saying, everything is possible with God. You don't just follow him. You can lean on him. He can help you do the impossible so you can receive a reward not only in the next life, Life, but in this life as well. So the disciples hear all this and they're like, man, who can do all that? And I think Jesus is saying, that's the point. You can't do it on your own. It's about what I'm going to do. Humanly speaking, it's not possible. But everything's possible with God. Everything is possible with God. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 28. Then Peter began to speak up. Peter says, one of Jesus' disciples, he says, we've given up everything to follow you. And he said, yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up, here it is, house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive what? Now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property. And then he throws this in, and persecution, hello. <laughs> and in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. See what Jesus is saying? He's saying, Lou, you can't give more to God than he'll give back. 
And he says, Peter says, hey, we, we've left our businesses, our fishing businesses. We left everything to follow you. And Jesus says, you're going to get all that back now, a hundredfold, and even more in eternity. You can't outgive God. And so when you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of your day to connect with God through prayer and meditating on his word, over time, you're going to receive the gift of wisdom, and you're going to get a sense of security that really is priceless. When you sacrifice time and energy to care for others and to seek their welfare, over time, you're going to get back the gift of friendship and support when you need it. When you sacrifice the need to be in control of everyone, and over time, what's going to happen is you're going to receive the gift of peace and patience, knowing that God has your back. See, when you sacrifice your income to give to the church or to causes God cares about, you receive the gift of purpose and joy, God's personal blessing and involvement in your finances. When you give up some freedom and allow God to direct your life, over time you receive the gift of adventure and the satisfaction of making a difference in the lives of others that you never imagined. Listen, when you sacrifice your right to get even with those who have wronged you and instead choose to forgive and leave the judgment to God, then over time you're going to receive the gift of, a, of an unhindered heart, free from enemies, free from bitterness. See, I believe God loves to bless his people. And he blesses us in so many ways, but he blesses us mostly with things money can't buy. Love, peace, joy, purpose, satisfaction. You get it back a hundredfold. So Jesus, through the story of the rich young ruler, is challenging us today. Is there something in your life that you're putting ahead of God? Is there something in your life that you know you need to let go of? Maybe it's money and things. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a dream, a career dream, something you want to go after, but you just deep down in your heart, you know, like this isn't it. Maybe it's a sin area in your life, an addiction, a habit that's been so destructive and and you know you've made it number one in your life. You need to let it go. Here's what I can tell you. There's a lot of fear there and there's a lot of sadness, but if you'll simply do it, you will never regret it. This week I was reading, praying through the Psalms each day like I do every day. And Psalm 92, the psalmist says this. He says to the Lord, you thrill me. He says, you thrill me, Lord, with all you have done for me. And I just stopped cold when I read that. And I just went back through my life. I sat there for an extended amount of time and thought of all the good things that God has done for me. This stupid kid crying his way back home, totally oblivious to the fact that God has so much more on the other side. And I just went through the list, my kids, my family, the central family, church, ministry, life, the opportunities to do the things that, that we get to do as a church family. And I thought, God, you just, you thrill me with all you've done for me. It doesn't mean my life's perfect. I got issues. I can tell you about those. I got problems. Some of them probably aren't going to be solved in this life. I got challenges. But God will thrill you when you will lay your life down and surrender it to him. And what you fear the most, letting go, if you'll let it go to him, you may find he brings it all back and even more, but in a way that's better suited for you and better fitted for you. Jesus says, everybody who gives, who lays it down, it'll come back, what do he say, a hundred times more, a hundred times more, God will bless you. You can't give up more than God will give back. He'll move and work in your life as you follow him. So if you want more satisfaction, my challenge is first trade up. Trade up to God's goodness and his blessing in your life. And then, even if it may feel like a sacrifice, then enjoy your reward because there will be one. Enjoy it and live in it. And it's not just for heaven. Jesus says a hundredfold now and into eternity. I've talked to a lot of longtime believers over the years, and I've heard the same thing again and again. People who've been through difficulty, sickness, hardship, lost loved ones, lost kids, went through all kinds of pain, but again and again, they look back over their lives and they say, man, 
God has been so good to me in ways I can't even put into words. They gave up a lot, but they got even more ultimately in return as they did. Just put God first. As Jesus says, follow me. Maybe you're at a place in your life where God's been tapping you on the shoulder, where he's been calling you to come home to him. And if you're there, I'd love to give you the opportunity to just respond to that. I'd love to lead you in a simple prayer to open your heart, to ask God to come in and move and work, to forgive you, to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for your sins. So I'm gonna ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you'd like to take that step of faith today, you can follow along and repeat this simple prayer after me. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges I'm always, I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer, if it's your commitment today, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Wherever you're at, if you're at one of our locations, if you're watching online, just slip your hand in the air and acknowledge you're reaching out to him and you're trusting him. You're going to follow him in your life today. Jesus says, follow me. Just lay it down and trust him. God, we thank you for your love and I thank you for each person reaching out to you and I pray you'll bless their lives as they follow you and as they seek you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual commitments in their life today. If you made a spiritual commitment, I want to encourage you at your location, just go to the Next Step area. We'd love to meet you there, give you a free gift, a journal called the Follow Him Journal. Uh, you can also just go to central.family and click the link, I've decided to follow Jesus, and we'll get all that information to you as well. Let's put our hands together for our different locations as they come to close out our experience. Well, this has been an incredible weekend. And before you go, I want to remind you that Central Academy kicks off this Monday. It's an amazing way for you to grow in your leadership abilities and your faith. And you are going to learn directly from some of our pastors here at Central. Now it starts on Monday and it's only once a week online. So if you want more information, go to central.family, click on that button that says Central Academy, and we will get you plugged in. Now, family, as you go throughout this week, I want you to hang on to Romans 8. That says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Keep showing up.